Welcome, I'm Deepak Bhatt, reporting for ACC.org here in Barcelona at the European Society of Cardiology. And I'm lucky to be here with Dr. Fred Beauvais to discuss some of the really exciting trials that were just presented. Maybe we can start off with the expert trial. That's probably the trial that could change clinical practice of the ones presented today. This was a trial in patients who needed elective cardioversion for atrial fibrillation, right, randomized yeah. either rivaroxaban or warfarin. What did you think? Well, you know, this is a big question that's coming up. We have more patients on NOAX, and uh, the question is if they, if they come up for cardioversion, can you use a NOAC pre-cardioversion compared to warfarin? We know about warfarin, right. don't know about NOAX. This was a trial that asked that question. And they compared rivaroxaban to warfarin. They had two groups, short, short time to cardioversion and delayed time to cardioversion. The, uh, short, the short time was uh, from randomization to cardioversion about five days and delayed about 25 days or so. The delayed group required uh, th the first uh, 30 days of therapeutic warfarin before they did the cardioversion. Rivaroxaban could have been used a little bit earlier, so they added, added, had an average of 25 days to cardioversion. The short, the short group was five days, and uh, both for warfarin and for uh, rivaroxaban. It's not clear uh, at this point how much heparin was used in that in that group, but the fact is both had the same about the same outcome: very low complication rates uh, in either case. And I think the message is you can use rivaroxaban. Uh, I think we could probably expand it to other NOACs as well, but right. you can use a NOAC pre-cardioversion without having to wait 30 days. I think it's pretty valuable information from the standpoint of uh, managing patients with AFib. Absolutely, and if you're going to wait for three weeks of therapeutic anticoagulation, of course, with a NOAC, you'll hit that sooner than having to wait for the warfarin to kick in. So potentially some practical advantages in terms of timing. Uh, another interesting trial I thought was the STIX trial. This was a trial of statins perioperatively for elective cardiac surgery to see if they could reduce AFib and other complications. And of course, there have been observational studies, small randomized trials suggesting potentially large benefits, in particular on AFib. But uh, what did the STIX trial show? Yeah, Rose, Rosuvastatin. Uh, 20 milligrams uh, starting uh, just before surgery and going uh, through through and after bypass surgery or cardiac surgery. No difference in the AFib rates uh, within the surgical post-op period and no other benefits that were apparent. So th there doesn't seem to be a benefit from the anti-inflammatory effect of a statin in improving the outcomes after, cardi after cardiac surgery. But I think it does show once again that small studies, observational studies, even small randomized studies can provide an overestimate of benefit or just a totally false signal, as appears to be the case here. That's not to say that statins aren't important just in patients with atherosclerosis who might be undergoing cabbage, but they don't have a specific uh, anti-inflammatory benefit periop. Well, what about the AMIOCAT trial? That was an interesting study, I thought, of patients who were getting AFib ablation, an increasingly common procedure for AFib, randomized to early AMIO or not. Well, I think, first of all, patients go into a afib ablation thinking that they're going to be cured after the first after the first procedure and right. you know we already know that probably about 35 or 40 percent of people are going to get a recurrence and need a second ablation so the question is could you reduce that recurrence rate by using amio amiodarone so this the the study was the uh, a look at using amio at the time of ablation for eight weeks post ablation to see if they could re reduce the recurrence rate. The first three months had a significant drop in recurrence rate, 34% in the AMIO group, 50-some percent in the, uh, in the uh, placebo group. So they were able to reduce hospitalizations in the first three months. The AMIO was for eight weeks and it was stopped. Uh, at six months, however, the outcomes were about the same in terms of recurrence rate. You could argue that this is just a study that tells you that amiodarone reduces the risk for atrial right. fibrillation because during that first three months, eight weeks of that was, was active amiotherapy and then it was probably a tail of another week or so with a little bit left over. So uh, you could argue that using amiodarone in, in the first three months can reduce hospitalizations a little bit. One could argue that if you, if you went longer than eight weeks, you might be able to reduce the recurrence rate at six months, but they didn't ask that question. Sure, although in a sense then you're kind of right back where you started from, right? Because you're still on an antiarrhythmic. So if the goal was to not be on an antiarrhythmic, yeah. uh, then the afib ablation may not have, have done everything it was intended to do, I suppose. 
But, but I think that is another key, though, confirmatory observation that the AFib recurrence rates were kind of high after an AFib ablation. So probably a lot of work that still needs to be done with AFib ablation to try to make it a more durable procedure. I, I think so. I mean, as I said, I think patients, patients kind of get the idea that they're going to be done after one procedure, and I think it's fair to, to be uh, honest with the patients that there's a pretty good chance that they're going to come back once in a year to get a second ablation if they want to get a reasonable outcome at the end of it all. Right. Uh, one final trial that I think is worth mentioning uh, that has, I believe, some relevance even uh, in uh, other parts of the world was a study done in Africa, and this was examining patients with tuberculous pericarditis, something that we may not see a lot of in the U.S., so you perhaps see a bit more of it than I do. Uh, where they studied steroids to see what effect there may have, and yeah. what do you think of that? Well, study? I, I, it, it talks a little bit about the healthcare in Africa. I mean, this is this is two thirds of the patients with HIV/AIDS, uh, so we already know that they're at high risk for, tubercul for tuberculosis. The you'll find similar types of of problems coming up in inner cities where there's a higher incidence of, of right. HIV as well. Uh, they asked the question of whether prednisolone would, would produce, improve outcome with, uh, after the diagnosis of uh, tuberculosis pericarditis. And they had, a, they had a, a vaccine which was made up of a similar bacteria that, uh, that they were using as a comparator. Uh, the, the message was that, number one, the vaccine didn't work and, and actually increased the risk of cancer at three years with, uh, with the HIV patients. Two-thirds of the patients had HIV. One of the sad things is only 14% of them were on antiretroviral therapy. Right. But the prednisolone did reduce the recurrence, uh, the, actually the rate of constrictive pericarditis, which is always a problem in TB pericarditis. So there was some benefit of prednisolone uh, in the first 90 days with a taper. And um, the vaccine didn't work, but talks about the, the health problems we see in the HIV population. Well, I would really congratulate the investigators in Africa for stepping up to the plate and doing a really challenging trial and, and providing very clinically useful information. Well, those were some of the exciting trials that we got to hear today at ESC. Hopefully that's useful to you back home.